We've talked a lot at Irish Breakdown over the last year, really the last several years, about how Notre Dame needs to take that next step as an offense. They have to be more explosive. They have to be more productive. This is especially true in big games. And when we talk about that, especially during the 2020 season, one of the key ingredients is RPOs. So in this video, I want to break down what RPOs work, what RPOs are, how they work, and why it's so important for Notre Dame to add them back into their offense and to not only add them back into, but making them and make them an even greater part of the offense, a foundational part of the offense. So to begin, before we really dive into the film, let's first talk about what is an RPO and why it's important for Notre Dame to have RPOs in their offense. So to begin, the definition of an RPO, it's an acronym for run pass option. And that's a philosophy in which a run call and a pass concept or a pass route are executed simultaneously on the same play. The quarterback will then make a decision to determine what will happen with the football. The options that he has, generally speaking, are come down to four things. Number one, he can hand the ball off. Number two, he can pull the ball and throw it. Number three, he can pull and run with a throw option, which is the lesser used one, especially at Notre Dame. And then fourth is the catch and throw. And so we're going to dive into all of those as we continue this breakdown. But let's let's first talk before we really dive into uh, you know the film and, and getting into the specifics of RPOs. Let's first talk about why Notre Dame should run RPOs and what do RPOs do? What are they successful for? Well, I think as with any offensive play, any offensive concept, there's going to be different reasons why you run certain plays and different things why one program is going to run it because it benefits them this way. Another program is going to run it because it benefits them that way. So for me, I want to focus more on why I think Notre Dame should run RPOs and what I think RPOs can do for Notre Dame. Number one, it protects the run game. Notre Dame can and should always be a strong running football team. RPOs allow Notre Dame to protect the run game. It's going to make the run game more efficient and explosive, which I'll get into. In, in the run game, when you're designing a run concept, when you're designing your running game plan, you're looking to gain numbers and leverage advantages. The defense knows this, and so they're trying to counter by gaining advantages in leverage and numbers as well. What RPOs do is they help neutralize the defense's attempts to outnumber the offense in the run game. We saw that with Notre Dame this year. For example, as good as Kyron Williams was this year, his 5.3 yards per carry was 0.6 yards per carry less than what Tony Jones had last year. I think we would all agree that Kyron Williams is a more explosive athlete than Tony Jones. So why, despite playing behind an even better offensive line, did he have less production in the run game from a yards per carry standpoint? It's because he was constantly running into boxes where Notre Dame was outnumbered. So even when the offensive line would get a body on a body, it was difficult for him to make those next level plays because he'd have to make one guy miss and then there was somebody else coming down the pike. RPOs help protect against that. RPOs also force defenses to play more man coverage, which plays right into Notre Dame's strengths from a pass receiver standpoint. Javon McKinley, whether it was against Clemson or North Carolina, or whoever they played, when he got man coverage and got the ball down the field, he was dangerous. And of course, this is true of players like Chase Claypool, Will Fuller, Miles Boykin in the past. RPOs also force defenses to be more, to, to into more post-snap decisions. The more decisions defenders have to make after the snap, the greater the, the opportunity for them to make a mistake, the greater the odds that they're going to make a mistake, which then obviously aids the offense. RPOs create better spacing on offense by forcing the defense to either widen or play for depth. They can't, they can't reduce the box. They can't bring their safeties down as much if you have an effective, efficient, and explosive RPO game. It also sets up more perimeter matchups if used correctly. And then RPOs obviously create more explosive opportunities in the run game and pass game. And that's something that a lot of coaches focus on. That's something a lot of fans focus on. For me, however, I think it's even more important that RPOs develop more efficiency on offense. And I'll explain why as I get into this. But I think efficiency leads to explosiveness. And if you're explosive without being efficient, you're not going to be as good as you are if you are an efficient offense. And the final one, and this is especially true for Notre Dame, I think RPOs take pressure off the play caller. 
You don't have to get the perfect call. Right now, if you run a traditional offense without RPOs, you have to make the right call against the right defense in the right situation. And if the defense isn't lined up how you think they were, how you hope they were, if they have a good play call on, then they're going to win that snap. RPOs neutralize that to a degree. If your game plan is sound and you've scouted them well and you're giving your receivers the route combinations that allow you to attack them if they're going to play the run or vice versa, attack with the run if they're going to play the pass, it makes you more right, and it allows you to be right even if your run call isn't where you want it to be. So RPOs kind of help neutralize that. And then RPOs also, if you're good at RPOs, if you run them constantly, teams have to now start defending to stop the RPOs, which then makes your play calls in the pass game, the play action stuff, and the run game where you're not running RPOs even more effective. So I think that takes a lot of pressure off Tommy Reese. It allows the emphasis to be to better benefit the actual game planning during the week and not necessarily the play after play play calling, which I think benefits any coordinator, especially a younger one. So those are the reasons why I think for Notre Dame, they should run RPOs and make it a bigger part of how they work. So let's begin by talking about when to give. That is option number one. The reality is what you're going to teach your quarterback in more instances than not, and especially at Notre Dame, is you want to hand the ball off. You're only pulling it and throwing it if the team play overplays the run. So let's go through the reads. And let's first begin by talking about the fact that Notre Dame has used RPOs in the past. If you go back and look at 2017 with Brandon Wimbush through the first nine games, they ran a lot of RPOs and they were very well executed. During that nine-game stretch, Notre Dame averaged over 40 points per game with an offensive offense that was run heavy. In 2018, when Ian Book first took over the lineup, if you look at their stats from the moment he took over to the end of the regular season, Notre Dame averaged over 37 points per game, over 480 yards per game, and six and a half yards per play. Ian Book himself averaged 306.9 passing yards per game, 8.9 yards per attempt, and he completed 70% of his throws. In 2019, RPOs became much less of a part of the offense, and by 2020, they were all but gone. During the next two years of Ian Book's career, he averaged, he completed just 64.6% of his passes, threw for only 234.6 yards per play, which is over 70 fewer yards per, per game, excuse me, not play, per game, than what he did as his first-year starter, and his yards per, per attempt went down from 8.9 to 7.8, and his, his QB rating dropped 16 points. So the longer Ian Book was in the system, the less effective he became. Now, a big part of that is the is the lack of reliance on RPOs, and I'm going to show you how some clips of the 2017, 2017 and 2018 offenses, why they were so effective and why they're needed in, the, in this current offense. And let's start with, again, when to give. Uh, this is a clip from 2017 against Wake Forest. Notre Dame, as you can see here, is in a two-by-two two formation. This is Equinemy St. Brown. This is Chase Claypool. Right now, Wake Forest is in a six-man box against Notre Dame's six blockers with a running back. So that is a good advantage for Notre Dame. What Wake Forest is going to try to counter with is having one of these two players try to squeeze down inside. That is why Notre Dame is going to read this overhang player, and he is now going to become the read key. The reality is if these safeties are having to make plays against the run all game, that is a benefit to you as an offense. What you don't want to do is allow this player to fold back inside and make plays in the run game. So as you're going to see at the snap, Brandon Wimbush is going to get his eyes on that read key, on that flat defender, and you can see it right now. Eyes are right on that defender. You can see it right there. He stays outside over Equinemy St. Brown, and so Brandon Wimbush hands the ball off, and it's a give. And now Notre Dame has great numbers in the box and they're able to get a big gain. And you can see the safety coming down. If again, for Notre Dame, if safeties are having to come down in the box and try to defend Josh Adams and Dexter Williams and Kyron Williams and Chris Tyree, that is a win for the Notre Dame offense. And as you can see here, this is an easy 10 plus yards in the run game for Notre Dame. This is 2018 with the in book at quarterback. You can see Northwestern five man box against Notre Dame's five blockers and a running back. That is a plus for Notre Dame. Northwestern, however, has this defender who is considered the most dangerous man. Notre Dame has two wide alignments. They're going to simply run the look screen outside. Northwestern has to decide whether they want to allow Notre Dame to have numbers and leverage advantages outside 
or do they want to allow Notre Dame to have a numbers and leverage advantage on the inside? You have to pick and choose. You can't defend both unless you have great players and Notre Dame players aren't great players. So that is a situation where they've put Northwestern into a bind and they've been able to say you hit. So right now by this alignment, Northwestern is going to have numbers to defend the pass here. Notre Dame has numbers in the box. So at the snap, Ian Book is going to get his eyes on this defender right here. That is the read key. And you're going to see when the ball snapped, that is right where Ian Book's eyes go. He is looking right here. That defender turns to work outside to defend against the screen. So Ian Book correctly just hands the ball off, and Dexter Williams is running right up the middle, untouched with a huge gap. And now the safeties and the outside defenders are having to close from distance to try to tackle him, and Notre Dame gets an easy 10-plus yards. Again, it does not take a great running back to get through this hole when you have numbers. And when you add a great line and really talented backs, that makes it even more effective. Next, same look, similar concept. When should the quarterback pull and throw? We're going to look at some clips from 2018 here. This is Ian Book against Navy. Now, in this game, I, if I'm, my memory serves me correctly, Ian Book, I believe, went 8 of 8 or 9 of 9 on RPOs. I don't have those numbers in front of me. What I do know is he went 26 of 32 in this game throwing the football. Incredibly efficient in this game. And obviously, Notre Dame jumped all over Navy, had a huge lead. Navy rallied, rallied back late, but it was never a competitive game, and it was over by halftime. Here, Notre Dame has a six blockers and a running back and a quarterback. Navy has six guys in the box. That's a plus for Notre Dame. This defender here, however, is the player that Notre Dame must worry about. So that is where Ian Book is going to read. And you can see outside of that defender, Notre Dame has this open access window. So they're going to run a slant and a hitch outside. And this read key is going to determine whether Ian Book is going to read inside out from Fink to, to Claypool or if he's going to hand the ball off, depending on what he does. It's just like what we saw the previous two clips. On this play, however, as you'll see the play go through, you see Ian Book gets his eyes on that read, that guy, and as soon as he steps down, Ian Book knows he's pulling it and he's throwing it outside. And so you, you see that action, and he reads inside out. This guy sits on the slant route. Now, he could have thrown the slant route, and he actually hits a similar slant route on a fourth down later in this game. This is a fourth or third down. This is a fourth and two situation. Think about that. Fourth and two. What do you do to stop Notre Dame? It's very hard to defend this. That guy comes down to defend the run. It's obviously a heavy, heavy rundown for Notre Dame. Ian Book sees it, pulls it, and completes about as easy of a fourth down conversion as you're going to see. Gets it out to Chase Claypool. Again, you do not need Devontae Smith, Chase Claypool, Will Fuller out here at receiver for this play to work. You don't need Trevor Lawrence, a quarterback, for this to be effective. It is going to protect the offensive line. It's going to make it. It's going to put defenses in much tougher binds. This year, when you face Notre Dame, it was much easier for teams to defend this type of play because Notre Dame was not going to pull this ball and throw it. Here's a play from 2017. Different route combination. You're going to have a go route up here, a quick out cut right here by, this is, I believe, Chase Claypool. And you're going to see... Similar concept, similar looking defense, six guys in the box, seven. This guy's really close to the box, okay? So really, seven in the box against Notre Dame, six blockers plus the back and quarterback. So this is a, a run that pre-snap is going to tell you, I'm thinking I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this ball and throw it, but you want to read it out because he could easily fly outside and get underneath this. So instead of just catching and throwing, which we'll show here in a second, Brandon Wimbush gets his eyes on the, on the read key, sees the open access window, and as soon as he sees that guy sit inside, he knows the ball's coming out. So as soon as you see that inside action by that flat defender, the ball's coming out. He squeezes, ball's coming out, throw the quick out. This is an easy six, seven-yard gain on first down. And it, again, it's easy money. It doesn't take a great quarterback or great receivers to do that. Now, this is a win to just catch and throw. There are times where a quarterback is not going to need to pull to go through the read process. And there's a couple instances when you're going to do that. Number one is the defense is lined up in a way where you know you have the one-on-one -on -one and they can't defend it. And we're seeing that a little bit here. It is Notre Dame's running a quick out cut here. Now, a hitch route, a slant, they, this guy can get underneath that route. This is a quick out cut. Chase Claypool is motion inside. He's going to run a five-yard speed out. There's no way this guy can really get underneath that route if you run, if you just catch and throw it. Okay. Plus, you see on film, 
you know Navy's not squatting here. With the way that the safety is, you know he's not going to do it. And the other reason is Notre Dame is running a, a run play to the right, a stretch play to the right. You can't fake the – you can't read that and then throw back. If they were running inside zone where Dexter Williams was coming downhill, Ian Book could get his eyes on a read. He could read it out if he wanted to. But here, he's got to make the decision to catch and throw. So as he, as he looks pre-snap to what's going on, he sees that read key in the flat. He sees the open access window, and he sees nine defenders really from the tight ends in. Okay, That is telling him, we've got the window. Let's take it. So Ian Book correctly makes that read, motions inside, takes a snap, and just catches it, plant, and throws it outside for easy yards. Again, does not take Chase Claypool, second-round draft pick, physical freak to execute this five-yard speed out. Now, Having Chase Claypool allows you to turn this from an eight-yard gain into a 12, 13-yard gain, but this is a play where first, second down, you are still stealing yards, and that's what you want to do. Another option is you can run a triple option. This is really only effective if you have a mobile quarterback. This is not necessarily something that I think you should do a lot, but I'm going to show you an example of it to show you just something else you can do. This is from the 2017 season. This is actually partly, uh, you can see the alignment. This is kind of part read option and part RPO, okay? Notre Dame is running a look screen outside. That means Chase Claypool is going to take a step and come back. Some people call it a now screen. Chris Fink is going to come out and block. Here, Brandon Wimbush is reading the traditional read zone, okay? This guy comes down, he's going to pull. This guy stays back, he's just going to hand it off to Tony Jones, okay? So once that guy makes his decision to take away the running play, Brandon Wimbush is going to pull it and get outside. Now he gets to the point where he is going to now have to make a decision off the read key, which is this defender right here. If this defender squeezes down, Brandon Wimbush will start to run, and then he'll just throw the screen out to Chase Claypool, and now you've got two on one. If he stays outside, then that clearly there's an open window, and now it's one of these guys has to be a better athlete than Brandon Wimbush, and they are not. And this is, again, this is a third and two, third and one. This is about the easiest third and one conversion you're ever going to see from any any team, especially against a, a, an opponent that won 11 games that year. So this is very easy, very effective, and something that you can certainly do. Now, here's something I want to talk about. This is why RPOs work and why they protect the run game. And that's really the emphasis for Notre Dame. So first and foremost, let's look at this. Let's keep one thing in mind. This is a Notre Dame offense coming into this USC game that was not a great throwing team by any stretch of the imagination. They were running for over 300 yards per game at this point in time in the season. USC knows they're going to run, but from an alignment and a scheme standpoint, they also know that they can throw an RPO here. So USC is trying to get seven guys in the box here, and then they've got this overhang defender against Notre Dame's six blockers in the running back and a quarterback. Okay, So they actually have decent numbers. But, th but this is – Notre Dame is running an inside zone here, so actually they have a nice cutback lane. So where the play is going to go, they have good numbers. USC then says, well, if this guy is going to come inside and help against the run, then Notre Dame is running a bubble screen here with Tony Jones with a blocker out here. That is not good numbers for USC. So, again, USC is trying to get a numbers advantage here. Notre Dame is going to counter that with numbers out here. Okay, so now Brandon Wimbush has to read that read key, and he's going to determine what he's going to do with the football. This guy has to stay outside to defend against the bubble screen. Otherwise, again, if he squeezes down here, this is two on one. That is big play for Notre Dame. So he has to stay outside. So even though Notre Dame's not a great running passing team, the threat of the RPO forces him outside. And look at this cut running lane that, that Josh Adams has. This is easy money. Again, another example. Notre Dame has six in the box, or USC has six in the box. These two safeties are playing down tight to protect the run or to defend the run. They're trying to get numbers. This guy, though, however, is the, is the bigger threat. But because Notre Dame had had some success throwing the ball downfield, because they were running RPOs, Notre Dame's going to cut back right behind into this guy's area, and he's going to have no clue what's happening. Watch this. The read key takes off running. Josh Adams is running right behind him, and he has no idea. And again, now you have to have safeties come from distance to try to tackle Josh Adams or Dexter Williams or T uh, Kyron Williams or Chris Tyree. I like those odds. Sometimes they're going to make the tackle, but if they do make the tackle, look, he's going to be three, four yards downfield before he can make that tackle. But if you make a miss, this is the kind of thing that happens. And remember, 
Josh Adams later in the game ripped off an 80 yard run. So these are the things that it can do for your offense and, and the advantages you have. Now let's fast forward to the Notre Dame 2020 offense. This is a matchup against Alabama. Notre Dame did not run RPOs. You could probably count on one or two hands at the most the number of times Notre Dame ran RPOs. And when they ran RPOs, they were calls. They weren't built into the system like you're supposed to have it. They were more of a call. And they were effective when they did it. But Alabama knows Notre Dame's not going to run an RPO, or the odds of it happening are very, very limited. So no, they have six guys in the box to Notre Dame six blockers. Okay, It would seem like it's good advantage for Notre Dame. But because there's no RPOs, you're going to see a lot of aggressiveness from this player and on this play, this player. At other times, it'll be a safety. The reality is, is when these teams aggressively attack Notre Dame like they're about to do right here, now all of a sudden Notre Dame is outmanned. And in fact, the fact that they got three yards on this play speaks volumes to how good the offensive line is and how good Notre Dame's running backs are. This should have been a tackle for loss. Dylan Moses comes unblocked. Chris Tyree makes a miss behind the line of scrimmage and picks up positive yards. This should have been a loss, but Notre Dame is really talented, which is why this turns into a three-yard game two and a half yard gain. Okay. Because look, Alabama has no fear of a play here. Now imagine for a second, this is Avery Davis. He's a pretty athletic kid. This is Ben Skoranek, who's a really good locker. Okay. Imagine if Notre Dame was running a play here where Ian Book decided, you know what? We're running a bubble screen. I see this guy is coming. And at the snap, he catches it and just throws a bubble screen out here. Now, this safety, who is a decent tackler but not a great tackler, has to run all the way out here to try to tackle Avery Davis in space. Now, maybe it's not a big play, but it's at least double what Notre Dame got here. Here's the other thing it does. If you have hit those five, six, seven-yard plays, not only does it create efficiency on offense, but now it puts Alabama in a bind. Do we keep trying to attack the run, knowing they're getting us these six, seven-yard chunks? And if that one – and here's the other thing. If that one guy misses, if this guy misses and he misses the tackle, or let's just say uh, he falls down, anything can happen. And now it's Avery Davis and Ben Skoranek against one guy. Now, that's a good player, Patrick Sertan, but he's not taking out two, two players. I think we can all agree on that. Now, all of a sudden, Notre Dame's in a situation where that's how you can rip off that big play. He just has to make one guy miss. That's it. Actually, I'm sorry, that's Tommy Trumbull on there and not Avery Davis. I'll still take that matchup. I still like that matchup, even with Tommy Trumbull there. But I think we can also say that in, in looks with Avery Davis, it would have worked well too. So that's kind of why I think Notre Dame needs to add RPOs, not just add them as a call, but add them as a base concept. It really is going to protect the run game. It's going to create more efficiency. It's going to create more explosives. I showed a couple simple concepts. I just want to wrap things up by showing a couple other looks that we see from teams that should be a part of what Notre Dame does. This is North Carolina this year against Wake Forest. North Carolina runs the ball very well, over two backs over 1,000 yards. You have to defend it. Wake has a six-man box. You can see this safety's peeking inside. This guy's peeking inside. So essentially, Sam Howell is going to read the get his eyes on a read key. That guy comes inside. This guy drops. That guy drops. But see, what happens is, is because you're trying to play these games, they're going to get their read key. Sam Howell sees this. They're running a quick post route here. Neither of these guys can defend that route. As long as Sam House patient, he he hits this this little quick post route right behind that guy, throws it into the open window, and it is stealing yards. You see RPO teams do this all the time. That's Daz Newsom, certainly a guy that Notre Dame could has guys that are similar to that. So that is a big time play. Here's another example: is from Iowa State. Iowa State is a very good running team. Brees Hall, I believe their running back led the nation in rushing this year. This is Brock Purdy, and again, these are athletes that Notre Dame certainly is recruiting to the same level of, and I would argue much better than, this is easy. Okay, Texas Tech, knowing that they're playing a running team, six in the box against six blockers, they're going to bring the safety down. They're trying to insert extra players into the box from all different places, and that's why the RPOs allow you to, to protect yourself. If, no, if they're running an inside zone here, all of a sudden they don't have great numbers backside. You, you look at the, the run Texas Tech has had, they've got this guy coming down to defend against that, but he's not. So now it's a one-on-one -on -one outside slant route. My guy's better than your guy, makes plays after the catch, big time play. This is Alabama against Tennessee this year. I purposely put a play in that A, was not a great throw by Mac Jones, and B, did not go to Devontae Smith. That way you can't say, well, of course that worked. That's Devontae Smith. Notre Dame doesn't have a Devontae Smith. This ball is going here. They're running a bubble concept here and a seam route here. This is Slade Bolden. 
three-star recruit would at best be Notre Dame's fourth or fifth best receiver at best. Okay. This is not a great throw from, from uh, Mac Jones, but watch here, Tennessee six in a box, seven here. They're trying to insert that safety because they're trying to protect against the run game. Okay. So Alabama is blocking for the run here. This is a, just a lock zone play. Okay. This is clearly in a zone play. Tennessee six, the box players all stay down. This guy's dropping, but he's not getting over top. He's protecting over top to defend those receivers. And it's basically here. But this guy's eyes, look, are in the backfield because he's worried about the run. Slade Bolden comes wide open behind him, just a little seam route. This isn't a great throw. It's a really good catch from an average receiver, and it's stealing yards. This is something Notre Dame could absolutely – you tell me Ian Book can't make that throw? Come on now. Tell me Notre Dame doesn't have a half a dozen guys at least that can make that play? Of course they do. This is an easy concept, and it protects the run. And now Tennessee's in a bind. Next time that they do this play, are we going to sit back and, and hope that they don't throw the ball? Now you're running it at us? So those are the those are the tough situations that you can put a team in. This Oklahoma State last play, um, I said earlier that they force you to go man-to-man. -man. It really does. In order to defend it, unless you have great players, you're going to have to play a lot more man than you want to play. Here, Oklahoma State is in their diamond formation. They have one-on-ones outside. This safety is cheated over towards the hash because the ball's on the far hash, and they're basically going one-on-one -on -one outside. The safety, unless the ball's late, the safety's going to have a hard time getting over top of that route. So Oklahoma State's quarterback sees it. You can see the reaction from the line and then the running back. The running back here starts to step like he's getting the ball, but he stops because he sees the quarterback just catch and throw. That's an RPO. It doesn't always have to have – uh, you know, the, the run fake, as I showed, you take the shot, throw it outside, give your guy a chance to catch it. Easy 20 yard gain. You went from being backed up in your own near your own end zone to now you're getting the ball well out past the 30 yard line. So those are the kind of situations that an RPO puts a team in. Those are the things that you can do to a team if, by running RPOs. You can protect your run game. You can become more efficient. You can become more explosive, and it makes you much, much harder to defend. And then when you have good players, when you have an offense that has guys like Chase Claypool, Miles Boykin, Will Fuller, C.J. Procise, uh, Javon McKinley, future years, Kevin Austin, Braden Lindsey, Jordan Johnson, Xavier Watts, Kyron Williams, Chris Tyree, Michael Mayer, when you have those kind of weapons, all you need at quarterback is a guy that can make good decisions and get the ball out accurately. We saw how dynamic Ian Book was his first eight games that season when RPOs were a big part of what they were doing. They were trying to protect a young quarterback with RPOs, and it worked tremendously. When they stopped protecting him and the run game with those concepts, the offense became less and less effective. This is a concept Notre Dame needs to bring back. They need to make it a core of who they are, something they rep every day, Almost every snap, they run it every game. It's not a call. It's a part of who you are. If Notre Dame does that. I believe that's step one of a couple very important steps to making this offense far, far more dynamic. You can be versatile with it. You can fit it to your personnel. You can do it with two tights. You can do it with four wides. You can do it with two backs. There's so many different ways you can do it. You can switch it up and game plan it every week. It really is a no-brainer that this needs to not only be added to the offense, it needs to become a staple of the offense. And if Notre Dame does that, we could see this offense in future seasons become dynamic, explosive, and a big-time unit, which when you consider how good the defense already is, is the final piece to Notre Dame taking that final step and becoming a championship program.